again. Everyone turn to Mark 15, and I will be reading to you verses 21 through 32. I would love for you to follow along. <laughs> Starting at verse 21 of Mark 15, it says this. Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. Speaking of Jesus, his cross. And they brought him to a place, Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. Verse 27, with him they also crucified two robbers, one on his left, one on his right, and the other on his left. So the scriptures was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with the scribes, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. Father, we pray in the next few moments that we have together that you would do a deep work in us, that you would draw us closer to yourself, that we would never grow old of hearing about the cross of Christ. Spirit of God, Guide us and direct us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. amen and amen. If you're taking some notes, our first point this morning is an unexpected blessing. An unexpected blessing. Uh, last week, we learned about uh, scourging, uh, the scourging of Jesus. You'll see on the screen here uh, a picture of scourging. So they would have a whip here. In this whip, they would have uh, pieces of lead and bone. So as they were to scourge uh, Jesus, this, these uh, pieces of bone and lead would uh, dig into the skin. It would rip the skin open. Uh, so scourging, the purpose was, of scourging was to uh, make an example out of the individual and for the most part beat them almost till death. So Jesus was scourged. We can imagine his condition after the scourging. He then now has to carry his own cross to a place called Golgotha. Jesus, at this point, is so weak he cannot carry his own cross. So the scriptures say in verse 21, they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian. Simon is an African man, and he's traveled around 800 miles to observe this Passover feast. You might remember in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus says this, and whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. What the Roman soldiers could do is at any moment they could say, you're working for us right now. So if they asked you to go one mile, you had to go. So then Jesus says, if somebody asks you to go one mile, go with them too. Here we have a very unexpected blessing. Has anybody ever been inconvenienced? Yep. You ever get frustrated when you're inconvenienced? You, you have a plan, you know what you want to do, you schedule out your day. You know exactly what you're going to do, what time you're going to arrive. You are ready to go. And then maybe you get a phone call and somebody says, hey, I need your help. You're like, oh. I'm busy. <laughs> Some of you have a problem saying no. So you're like, okay, what can I do for you? When it comes to inconveniences, we get so frustrated because we have a plan and a purpose. Here in our text, the unexpected blessing for Simon of Cyrene was that he came to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover with all of its uh, symbolism, but he had an opportunity to meet the Passover lamb. Think about that. He, he comes to, 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 to Jerusalem to celebrate 
shadows of things, uh, uh, images and, and Passover lambs, but he now has the opportunity to meet the actual Passover lamb. Now, now imagine, imagine Simon and imagine Jesus's condition. Blood is everywhere. Jesus is in a, a tremendous amount of pain. And then they, they ask Simon, hey, come carry this cross. Come help this man, Jesus. You can imagine Simon going, I, I didn't come to, to Jerusalem for this. He's bloody, he's groaning, he's near death. I, I came here to, to celebrate. I've come here to worship and carrying this guilty man's cross is not what I signed up for. Imagine the condition of Jesus. Isaiah said that Jesus was, was beaten beyond recognition. But the beauty is, Simon of Cyrene, an African man, had the blessing of hearing the, the groans of God in flesh go through his ears. He had the, the blessing uh, of, of possibly even holding Jesus up. He had the blessings of Jesus, Jesus' blood to get all over him. He had the blessings even to maybe pick Jesus up a time or two. So something so horrific, uh, something so, so wicked, but something so beautiful, Simon of Cyrene, he walked with God in the flesh. We could say at his weakest moment, Simon of Cyrene, was inconveniently asked to, to carry the cross of Jesus. It's interesting that uh, Simon Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, said, I'd go with you to the end. There's a different Simon that's here walking with him to the end. It's this, 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 this unexpected inconvenience. It's this unexpected blessing that, that Simon of Cyrene is part of that. He's actually walking with the Passover lamb. He's come to, to, to Jerusalem to worship, but is there any greater worship than what he's doing right now? Walking with Jesus, picking Jesus up, carrying a cross for Jesus. I mean, what, a, what an honor, what a, what a blessing. Now, what's so beautiful is that the gospel of Mark was written to uh, Roman believers. And many believe that Simon uh, of Cyrene uh, became a believer and he went back home. Those of you that want to do a little deeper study, you want to read Romans 16 of uh, verse 13 because it mentions one of Simon's sons. Beautiful, beautiful study. Well, what can you and I learn from our, our, our first point? The Bible says that you and I are to also carry one another's burdens. That's Galatians 6 verse 2. It says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If we could say it like this, there was a time in Jesus's ministry here where he needed somebody to help, right? Why is it that you and I find it so hard asking for help? If Jesus at this part of his, of his ministry, of his, of his obedience to the Father, if he needed help, why is it you and I don't ask others for help? Are we afraid someone's going to judge us that we're going to be, we're going to be, that, that somebody's going to say, hey, go, you're weak. You know, we want you to, to, to man up. That's just not Bible. The Bible says that we are to carry one another's burdens. Every one of us in this room are going through a little something, something. A little something, something. Have you invited someone else into your life to help you carry that something, something? Or are you a little too prideful? I don't want anybody to know that I struggle in this area. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll get through it my own way. And then we have the audacity to say, God, what are you doing? You might say, what are you doing? Why aren't you asking somebody to help? Why aren't you asking your brother or sister to help carry your burden? Oh, well, you know, I'm kind of a private person. Mm -hmm. Does your Facebook say that? Back to the message. <laughs> now, carrying someone's burdens don't mean that, doesn't mean that we, you know, we'll come and remodel your house for you. But it does mean that we'll, we'll walk with you. It means that we'll meet with you once or twice a week and take you through the scriptures or take you through a book and we'll, we'll, we'll check in and have some accountability. It's a beautiful thing to say, I'm here for my brother. 
I'm not here to judge you. I'm here to, to walk with you. I, like, I need somebody to walk with me. Thank you for that one person, wherever you are. <laughs> Jesus, I need people to, to, to walk. Hey, pastor man, how are you doing? I'm not so good. Well, hey, ask you the question. Are you in the word? Are you in prayer? Are you in fellowship? How are you and the wifey doing? This is, this is necessary to, to have somebody walk with you to, to help carry that burden. This is, is a beautiful thing. And how blessed is Simon of Cyrene? Traveled almost 800 miles. But he traveled almost 800 miles and he met the creator of the universe and helped him to carry his cross. How beautiful is is the scriptures. Well, verse 22 goes on. It says, and they, they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. So if you go to, uh, to Jerusalem, uh, the, the tour guide may drive you past a little, it's like a little hill. And in that hill, there's like two indentations for some eye sockets and uh, an indentation for a nose. They believe it might be the place, but no one really knows. Well, verse 23, it says, then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink but he did not take it. In Matthew's gospel, it says that they gave him a wine mingled with uh, with gall. And this uh, this gall was... Uh, was, be- was meant to, to deaden the senses. It, it was meant to, uh, to kind of uh, numb, be like a numbing agent so an individual would not feel all of the pain of uh, their death on the cross. What we love about Jesus is fully awake, no Novocaine, no morphine, no Percocet. He was just uh, drinking the cup of his suffering. He, didn't, he wasn't numb by any stretch of the imagination. He was totally awake. So he did not take this myrrh to drink or this gall, as Matthew's gospel says. Well, verse 24, it says, Then, and when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. This is a fulfillment of prophecy given 10, 000, or, uh, 1,044 years before It came to be. Psalm 22 says, They divide my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lots. We're going to read Psalm 22 also next Sunday, so you want to check that out. It was a Bible prophecy that was fulfilled. Verse 25, it says, Now it was the third hour. Let me give you um, how Jews reckon time. So they reckon time from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So the third hour was 9 a.m., the sixth hour was noon, and the ninth hour was 3 p.m. You're going to need to remember that for next week. Now, the Gospel of John uses different times because it is a, he's using a Roman system. So the systems between the Jews, uh, uh, time system and the Roman systems were different. Well, it says, and they crucified Jesus, and the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. Our next point this morning is don't forget to read the sign. Don't forget to read the sign. Signs are good. They, they serve to inform. Uh, they serve to sometimes even warn an individual. Signs are good to help you find your way. Has anybody ever been lost? Yeah, with a phone, with GPS, yep, yeah, yeah. been, been lost. Uh, I think about a month ago, I uh, went to uh, visit some family in, uh, in Oklahoma, and I had a layover in, in Dallas, and their airport's a little confusing. So <laughs> it's like, take the tram, go upstairs to go downstairs, and take a taxi cab to the, to the thing. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know where I'm going. But then there's, there's signs in the airport that'll, you know, have you know, little things going this way and little things going this way. And then they have a person uh, for information. So you can say, hey, I am completely lost. Here in our text, God in his grace gives everyone a sign. Listen to Luke chapter 23, verse 38. It says, and an inscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. So we have Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. Here in, uh, for the Passover, one commentator said there was as many as 2 million people in Jerusalem at this time. So imagine God knowing that. He makes a sign so everyone in Jerusalem would be able to read that this 
is the king of the Jews. Why does this make a difference? Listen to verse 27. It says, with him, they also crucified two robbers, one on his left and one on the right. Turn to, to Luke with me really quick. Just make a right turn where you are. Luke chapter 23. And when you get there, give us an amen. Luke chapter 23. We're going to read verses uh, 38 through 43. As we talk about these two robbers and the sign that they saw. Luke chapter 23. Starting at verse 38. Everybody there? All right. Listen to this. It says, and an inscription also was written over him in letters of Hebrew, or uh, yeah, Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Verse 41. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Listen to verse 42, family. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Push pause. Jesus is not preaching about a kingdom. How did this thief know that Jesus had a kingdom? He read the sign, King of the Jews. Maybe this thief said, if he's a king, maybe he has a kingdom. All he did was read the sign. Jesus isn't preaching on the cross. He's not saying, hey, there's a kingdom that you should receive. This thief simply reads the sign and says, king of the Jews. Huh. King, kingdom. King, kingdom. And, and listen, to, listen to what Jesus, Jesus says. So he says, uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, he says, today you will be with me in paradise. He said, like this day. He didn't say, you need to go to purgatory. You need to, you know, you need to atone for your own sins. You need to suffer. No, he says, he says, this day you will be with me. So this, this criminal simply read a sign. That's all he did. He read the sign that, that God put above his son. This is the king of the Jews. Everybody can see the sign, but this criminal read the sign and he says, huh, a king can do whatever he wants. A king can pardon anybody he wants. A king can bless whomever he wants. A king can take life and give life, right? Just maybe this king will remember me. I know I'm guilty. I know I'm sinful. I know I'm, I'm caught red-handed. But just maybe this king will remember me when he comes into his kingdom. Jesus said, you better believe it. This day, you're going to be with me. Think about this. Holy, spotless, righteous Jesus says, you criminal, you're going to be with me today. Is that not like wild? Yes. Oh, we, 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 t- we tend to equate Jesus And all of his followers are holy. When we get to heaven, we're going to see a bunch of murderers. Right? If you know your scriptures, (laughs) Moses, bunch of murderers, bunch of drunkards, reformed, of course. Right? (laughs) Jesus says, today you're going to be with me in paradise. In verse 31, it says, likewise. Maybe this this, this, uh, thief on the cross he heard verse 31, it says this, likewise the chief priests also mocking among themselves what the scribe said, he saved others. Maybe this thief is going, hmm, Jesus saved others. Maybe he saved others that were in my condition, sinful, guilty. Just maybe he'll save me. Maybe you're here today, friend, and somebody invited you to church, and they said, hey, he won't talk too long. <laughs> just come, just come to church. And now you get a chance to hear that Jesus forgives, that he redeems and he renews and he restores. Maybe in your mind you're thinking, I'm too far gone for for God to save me. This thief wasn't too far gone for God to save him, so I am quite certain that you are not too far for God to save you. How wonderful is Jesus. You and I need to remember that Jesus is in the business of, of saving people. 
And we need to remember that you and I were once in darkness. If we're not careful, family, we're going to act like the religious people in Jesus's day. And the religious people in Jesus's day had some serious issues and Jesus had issues with them. In Matthew chapter 21, you won't, you won't see it on the screen here, but listen to this. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you that tax collectors and harlots enter the kingdom of God before you. They're going, wait a minute. Tax collectors were hated. And we know who, what a harlot is. Jesus says, they will enter the kingdom of God before you. He says, why? For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But tax collectors and harlots believed him. And when you saw it, you did not afterward relent and believe him. Let you and I, God forbid you and I would become religious. Uh, that, 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 that somehow there'd be some demarcation between the thief on the cross and you and I. That somehow we would look at Barabbas and ourselves as, as somehow totally different. That is not the case, family. Well, back to our text in verse 28. It says, so the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and he was numbered with uh, transgressors. This is a quote from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 53, 12. It says, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 29. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Our second point this morning is Jesus didn't come to save himself, but to save you. Jesus didn't come to save himself, but to save you. They think that they've won. They think that Jesus is on the cross and he made all of these grandiose statements about destroying the temple in three days. Hey, Jesus, come down from, from the cross and, and save yourself. Family, Jesus came to die on a cross for a ransom for many. He came to save us from our sins. And if Jesus came down from the cross, we are wasting our time here this morning. If Jesus didn't go to the cross, then there would be no resurrection. If there was no resurrection, then you and I would not be rising from the dead when we pass away. We'll learn about it next week. The Apostle Paul says, uh, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that our faith is futile and we are still in our sins. So he's being mocked by these chief priests. He, he saved others, but he could not save himself. You might remember when Jesus was uh, being betrayed in the garden that Peter took out a, a sword and he cut off Malchus's ear. Listen to what Matthew says about this account. It says, or do you think that I cannot now pray to my father and he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that this must happen? So at any time in Jesus's earthly ministry, he could have called upon the father and the father could have sent legions of angels to save him. But if Jesus would have been saved, then you and I would not have been saved. We could simply say that love kept Jesus on the cross. That'd be accurate. But we also need to say it was obedience that kept Jesus on the cross. Obedience to, to his father kept Jesus on the cross. We, we these days make, a, make a, 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 a lot about love, which is, which is important. But we also need to remember that Jesus came to be obedient, that it was his obedience to the, to the cross, his obedience that gave him this joy. But it is here on the cross where Love was poured out. Many of you know John 3.16, but maybe some of you are here or you're online or outside and you, you don't know John 3.16. It says, for God so loved the world. Was it what, 8 billion people in the world now? God so loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son. That means his only unique son. It says that whosoever 
That means anybody. That means you and you and you and you. No matter where you've been, no matter what you've done, no matter what struggles you have, it's just that whoever would simply believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Hallelujah. That, that like, whosoever, no matter the, the, the darkness we've been in, if we would simply believe or not, we would not perish but have everlasting life. The last thing to give you one more, Romans 5.8. It says, but God, it says, demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, what did Jesus do? He died for us. Did he die for us when we became better? When we started going to church? When we stopped cursing, stopped drinking, stopped doing drugs? He says, oh, now you're worthy of me dying for you. No, it says, while we were still yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's why we love us some Jesus wasn't waiting for us to be better or do better. He says, in your, in your sin, I'm going to provide a way for you to, to have hope. Family, that Jesus would deny himself to ransom us, that he would endure such pain and such treatment for our sakes, leaves us, leaves us speechless but yet worshipful, leaves us horrified but yet awestruck, leaves us stained but yet clean. It leaves us in tears but yet with our hands raised when we think about the, the cross of Christ, how beautiful is the cross. And we, we live in a culture where it's like, it's like cross-saturated, um, where we, we've, we, we've turned something horrific into, into something fashionable. And I was telling earlier earlier service that I pray that we never lose, we never lose the, the, the truthfulness, the, 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 the greatness of God and, and, and the horror in the cross that we wouldn't, as Calvary Chapel Beaumont folks, ever grow tired about hearing about the cross, that we wouldn't grow tired of hearing about Jesus dying on the cross, that, that when we hear about the cross, that we would say, that's, that's where my sin was nailed. That's where my sin was paid for. That's, that's where hope was born for me. They're, they're on the cross of Christ. So verse 32, it says, let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. So they're saying, if we can see a sign that we're going to believe, they've seen signs for the last three and a half years, and they still don't believe. We're going to read about the resurrection next week and the week after. They're still not going to believe. And for that, I'll say this to you, family. Be careful of saying stuff like, well, if you do this, then I'll believe. You don't have to raise your hands, but just give me a parking stall. (laughs) Then I'll believe. Make all of these red lights green, and then I'll believe. The God of creation we have brought down to parking stalls and green lights. If you do this tiny thing, then I'll believe. And God forbid they all go green, right? (laughs) You're like, it worked! God is real. How do you know? I had green lights. <laughs> the Bible says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. So may you and I not have to see stuff to believe. May we just, may we just, we just read and the spirit of God makes this come alive and we say, amen, I'm in. <laughs> Here's all my chips, I'm in. I believe. I don't need any signs. I don't need you to give me parking spaces, although it's cool sometimes. <laughs> Green lights will be great, especially on Highland. <laughs> we got to move on from that because I'll... <laughs> but I just believe. I just believe. It, it, it may be... Most, if, if you're struggling with, with some things, let's not look for signs. Let's just, let's just read the sign. Let's just read this. There's nothing, if the cross of Christ hasn't captured you, family, I'm not sure what, what else will. All right, third point is, coming off the cross wasn't the miracle. Coming out of the tomb was. Coming off the cross wasn't the miracle. Coming out of the tomb was. Come down that we may see and believe, and even those who were crucified with him, reviled him. 
Our entire faith rests upon the, the empty tomb because Jesus came out of the empty tomb. All of us will be resurrected one day. Hallelujah. The Bible says that we're going to get some, some new bodies. Thank you, Jesus. Some of you guys got some titanium hips and, and knees, and you got some fusions of all these things, and your ankles pop, and the, the back is not good. But well, one day, we're, I wonder what's going to happen to all this, this knees laying all over the earth, the earth right? Just <laughs> knees and hips just strode out all. I say, who did this belong to? Well, they're not here anymore. They got something new. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us new, a new body. I'm looking, I'm looking forward to it. It's the resurrection family. After Jesus rose from the dead, everything changed. Acts chapter 6, verse 7, it says, And the word of God increased. They're preaching about the cross and the resurrection. It says, And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests hmm, were obedient to the faith. Hmm, after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, here's that one scripture I'll talk to you about, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It says, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. It's all about the resurrection of Jesus. How great is Jesus and what wonderful obedience that he had to the Father, that that is what set us free. David Guzik says, it is bad enough that the Son of God came to earth and man murdered him in the most tortured way possible. Worst of all, sinful men enjoyed doing it. This is, this is our nature. Now, you and I would hope that if we were alive during this time, we would not be the ones asking for Barabbas instead of Jesus. I don't know. That's a sobering thought, right? Would you and I be asking for Barabbas? Would you and I even follow Jesus? The Bible says that there's nothing about Jesus that would attract us to him. I'm glad that you and I are born in the era that we have been born in. Because seeing is not believing. Jesus might have walked past all of us and we wouldn't have taken a second look. But being born in this era... Hallelujah. God had a plan and a purpose for us that we would hear his word and receive his word. Hallelujah. Well, lastly, verse 32, it says, even those who were crucified with him reviled him. We know one of those criminals repented as we read in the gospel of Luke. Let me give you two things to take home with you before we go to a place of communion. The first one is look for blessings in your inconveniences. Uh, look for blessings in your inconveniences. So perhaps this week, all of us will be inconvenienced in some way, shape, or form. And we might miss it. So maybe halfway through the frustration, let's say, maybe the Holy Spirit says, hey, Pastor Man was talking about that this week. You're all frustrated. Why don't you look for the blessing? Look for the blessing in the inconvenience. Just maybe in the inconvenience this week, God is intending to bless you with something. But if you and I are just, I got to go, I got to get, I got to get. Maybe Jesus says, hey, slow down a little bit. I, got, I, have, I have something for you. I'll tell you what, when I, uh, when I met Jesus, it was an inconvenience. I wanted to go home. <laughs> it was my last run of the day at Mission Federal Credit Union, working in the mailroom department. Went up to the marketing department, came to get the mail, the guy asked me, hey, do you, do you believe in God? I'm like, oh. <laughs> I just want the mail. <laughs> That's all I want. I tell you what, we talked for two plus hours. He led me to Jesus that night. It was the greatest inconvenience of my life. <laughs> I, I, I'm glad I didn't, didn't just leave. This brother told me that Jesus loved me, and I said, Psh, I'm currently sleeping with my girlfriend, and we got two kids. He says, Jesus, Jesus loves you, and when you die, 
if you receive him, you'll go to heaven. I'm like, no way is this possible. He told me that Jesus loved me. Jesus would forgive me and give me hope and peace. I said, if that's true, <laughs> I'm all in, sir. I tell you what, we said a really short prayer, totally set free. 29 years ago, just, just a, a simple little, little this, and it was inconvenient. But praise the Lord that God had a plan for a young, sinful man, living wrong, doing wrong, talking wrong. He planned to, to save me that, that night. And if you're here and you're not saved, I want to tell you, Jesus got a plan for you. It may be inconvenient. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful journey with Jesus. So look for blessings this week and your inconveniences. And number two, make a list of what Jesus accomplished on the cross because you're going to need it for next week. So that's your homework. Make a list of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, and we will talk more about it in depth next week. Well, we're at the place of communion, and communion is a wonderful time for us to remember the cross. So here at the communion table, we are to remember what Jesus has done for us. We're going to read later on that he says, do this in remembrance of me. That there is this, this action, this, this, this time at the communion table where, where we can remember that you and I are great sinners, but Jesus is a great Savior. It's here that, that we remember the, the cross. It's here where we remember that all of our sin was nailed to the cross but then, family, we also must remember that it was your sin and my sin that placed him there at the cross. That there was no other way to save us. There was no other way to forgive us of our sins than for Jesus to be that sacrificial lamb. So the next time we think that sin really doesn't, eh, God doesn't really look at it the way, you know, the way um, that we think he does. No. Sin cost Jesus his life. That my sin and your sin is what Jesus paid for on the cross. So as we pass out the communion elements, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you don't have anything to remember. But the better thing would be is for you to receive Jesus as your Savior and ask him to forgive you of your sins so you have something to remember. Father, we thank you for these moments that we've had in your word and if you're here or you're online or outside and you, you've never received Jesus as your Savior, maybe you're away from him. If you're away from him, just turn around and come back. And if you've never received him, I would say, what are you waiting for? No one's asking you to be religious. We're not even asking you to join this church. But what we are, the invitation we are giving to you is, that God will take you from darkness into light, from hopelessness to hope, from misery to joy, that you would know the greatest love ever found in Jesus Christ. And if you desire Jesus to transform your life, we need to make a, say a, a simple prayer. And the prayer is, Father in heaven, forgive me a sinner. Jesus, I believe you died on a cross for my sins and three days later you rose again from the dead like the thief on the cross I'm calling out for you to remember me Jesus save me give me this hope give me this love I've been hearing about give me a future take me out of this darkness that I'm in and bring me into your marvelous light for I ask these things in Jesus name and if you said that prayer, the Bible says as far as the east is from the west, as far as he has separated uh, you from your sins, that you are this new creation in Christ. Old things have passed away and all things have become new.